Yesterday, a magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake off the coast of Russia, and this prompted not only aftershocks, but also a tsunami. Joining me now to talk more about the physics of all of this involved and what transpired overnight and this morning is Dr. Andrew Newman, professor of geophysics from Georgia Tech. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. So, Dr. Newman, let me start off with this. Magnitude 8.8. .8. That's a really strong earthquake on the Richter scale. Can you put that in perspective of how this compares to other earthquakes over the last one or two decades? Sure, it is, it is certainly one of the biggest earthquakes we've seen recently. The, um, you know, it is smaller than what happened in, let's say, Japan in 2011. Uh, but it's comparable to some other really large and devastating earthquakes. There is one almost the exact same size in, uh, in, in an area called Malay of Chile uh, that occurred in 2010 that created a really uh, created a lot of local damage there as well as a large tsunami. Now it actually seems like this Kamchatka earthquake created a larger tsunami traveling over the ocean than that of uh, another other event. But it is certainly one of the largest events that uh, has occurred in my lifetime. So a big event, and we've seen a lot of aftershocks. Um, how long can we expect more of those aftershocks to take place that may be above, say, a magnitude five or six? Okay, so those events, magnitude five or six events, may occur, you know, over the next year or several years. It really every every fault surf environment is a little bit different. The um, for the most part, what we think is that the largest aftershocks are usually going to be about an order magnitude smaller than the main shock. So we may see an event up to about a magnitude 7.8, 7.6 to 7.8. Uh, sometimes they're bigger than that. They surprise us. But uh, that is generally what we see for most events is that we can get some pretty large aftershocks um, or we could even have another really large event on the fault that's next, um, that the, the segment of the fault that's next to a ruptured uh, last night. And let's talk more about that fault and, and what type of earthquake occurred. How does this one vary from some other earthquakes that we see in other parts of the, the uh, world? Why did we see a tsunami generated by it? Sure. So this type of fault is what we call a subduction zone fault. And the, the type of the we actually have a special name for it and we call it a mega thrust. And so a thrust event is any time where one piece of land gets thrust underneath another piece of land. Uh, a mega thrust is when you do that and it's really big. So we're not very creative with our names. Um, so these mega thrust faults are occur in subduction zones, as I mentioned before, and they are all around our, uh, particularly the Pacific Ocean. That's why we call it the Pacific Ring of Fire. Uh, and we see, um, these are also the places where you see the absolutely largest earthquakes. So just like the Japan earthquake, the one that occurred way back in 2004 in Sumatra, and the largest earthquake we ever saw, which is one in Chile back in uh, 1960, which is a magnitude 9.5. Um, I think that was it for that question. Or you asked why you create a large tsunami. So yeah, yeah. Um, why why such a large tsunami, and why did it propagate all the way? Can you explain why it propagates all the way across the ocean? Sure. So the um, these create really large tsunamis, and first off, because these mega thrust earthquakes are or faults are almost entirely in oceanic environments, and so of course, if you want to create a tsunami, it's better to be underwater. Um, but also because these faults are really large and because really sort of the orientation. So the San Andreas fault is, you know, side by side, the motion is side by side. So that's not, if that was underwater, it's not going to create a large tsunami. However, these mega thrust faults where one dives beneath another, it's actually that upper plate when it pops up, it creates really large waves. And so that part that pops up may pop up as much as 10 to 15, 20 feet, depending on how big the earthquake is. And that's going to lift the entire water column around it, you know, by that much. And then that wave just kind of propagates away. The bigger the earthquake, the more that gets lifted up and also the larger the area that gets lifted up. So it's like the bigger, the bigger the earthquake, the bigger the foot that's stopping in a puddle that will move move away from it. And so these really large earthquakes, one's generally greater than about a magnitude 8.5. These are what we call giant earthquakes. Those are the ones that are most likely to create these uh, tsunami waves that travel all across the ocean. So we call those things transoceanic uh, 
earthquakes or tsunamis from from those earthquakes. And and we saw the first images coming out from Russia yesterday evening of that tsunami wave generating. How tall were the waves or the height of that tsunami as it arrived in Hawaii and kind of northwestern United States early this morning? Yeah, so those waves, and as a matter of fact, the tsunami threat has not yet passed in the Pacific. So there are still tsunami waves that we are expecting to hit in places like South America um, later this morning. But uh, Hawaii got pretty good waves. The largest that I saw was on the order of uh, six feet, so almost two meters um, high. In the uh, western United States, depending on where you are, the, the, the numbers were smaller than that, but they were generally on the order of a couple of feet. Uh, which is good. There are a couple of places where you generally get a uh, pretty strong localization of the tsunami waves where they, where they have a tendency to build up higher. I haven't actually seen reports back to see what the maximum amplitudes were in uh, the West Coast. You may and know so that. There were so many people yesterday that got the alerts and they heard the alerts over the loudspeakers and the Hawaiian Islands and everything to move to higher ground. For those who have never lived um, in an area that could be vulnerable to tsunamis, say the West Coast or Hawaii or, or maybe the Aleutian chain in Alaska, why is it important to move to that higher ground immediately when you hear that uh, notification? So tsunami waves, when they come in, um, they're, they're not like wind-driven waves where the, uh, where the waves just sort of crash and they lose their energy right away at the coastline, but they can travel a very long distance inland. It's, it's kind of like a tide. As a matter of fact, that's why we call them tidal waves sometimes, because the entire water column raises higher. And it moves in and it can stay for some uh, for a pretty long period of time. And so, um, you know, you might think of a six, you know, as a six foot wave is like, oh, yeah, that can splash me pretty well. But it's actually like the ocean rises for six feet, you know, and will do so for maybe 30 minutes, maybe even longer than that. And so uh, if you, the ocean rises for six feet really quickly, <laughs> then you can very, and, and it rushes into the environment, it can very, very quickly knock things over, push them further landward. But then if you're not attached well to solid ground, pull it right back out to the ocean. I think of that and correlate it almost to storm surge and hurricanes because it is that wall of water as well that comes building in, but not as instantaneous as a tsunami. Now, earlier you were talking about how this occurred on the Ring of Fire. You do some research along the Ring of Fire pertaining to earthquakes in the Aleutian chain in Alaska. Can you talk to us more about that? And if you might get any data from this particular earthquake, how it correlates to Alaska's impacts? Sure. So one of the things that we've been doing for a while now is been using different tools to measure how the ground is deforming between large earthquakes. And we can use that information to see which faults are actively building up energy for releasing these large earthquakes. We've been doing it for, for now about 30 years on land really well with things like GPS. Um, but as we were just talking about, these large, particularly tsunami generating earthquakes occur under water. And so in order to make those measurements underwater, we have to use some different tools. And so we either will go out on a ship or we'll send these small autonomous uh, vehicles out on the sea surface. And we, the ones that we use look like big surfboards, but they're going around and they're actively using acoustic, uh, acoustic signals to uh, what we say, ping down to, to these instruments on the seafloor and measure how they're moving over time. Now, these movements aren't fast. They're on the order of, you know, one to two to three inches a year. But depending on how much those move, we can really tell, you know, whether or not that area of the fault is building up for uh, larger earthquakes. And so we've just started a couple of different experiments there across a large segment of the Alaska Peninsula and the Aleutian Islands. And uh, we are actually actively making those measurements right now as that tsunami is passing by. And so a really cool piece of this beyond just seeing what's happening in Alaska and how it's building up for future um, uh, earthquakes, those instruments, those autonomous surface vehicles are also measuring exactly what the sea is doing at that time. And so as those tsunami waves move by, they may have been on the order of two to three feet high. And so when we get back to that high rate, the, the high quality data from those instruments, we should be able to see that tsunami passing, um, uh, passing by those, uh, uh, the, uh, those instruments uh, at that time. 
So you'll get a little bit more perspective on this particular event, but also maybe you say you look at the, the sea floor and everything. So did this tsunami or this earthquake rather build up more pressure in Alaska? Is that one of the things that you might be able to eventually find or am I not making a good connection there? Uh, the so the the sections of Alaska that we're looking at are probably too far away for the for this Kamchatka earthquake to directly uh, add additional load to or increase the pressure to. Um, that we do sometimes worry about just the strong shaking of seismic waves passing by triggering some earthquakes, but generally those earthquakes are really small that we see triggered. Those things are usually on the order of magnitude twos to fours. Uh, we, so we don't expect this to trigger something big in Alaska um, or even add additional load to it to make the next earthquake faster. But uh, we can see, it's just another way for us to actually be able to see the tsunami as it's passing in the open ocean. The oceans are great, they're large, but it's a place where we actually have relatively little data, generally, of all types. Yeah, because there aren't just people scattered throughout like we have at land. Um, if you had to kind of summarize, what, what do people really need to know about this earthquake event and the tsunami uh, for those who have not been familiarized on what's occurred over the last uh, 18 hours? Okay, so um, yes, right now, I mean, that the earthquake occurred as you can see in another country, um, that's you know halfway around the world. But these large earthquakes can occur in any, really in any uh, country that has one of these subduction zone environments. And so the United States actually has three of them. We have one of them off of the Pacific Northwest uh, that runs all the way from Northern California up through Southern Canada. We have another one that's across a large segment of Southern Alaska, and we have another one finally over over by Puerto Rico. So all these uh, environments are capable of building up these really large earthquakes and tsunamis. And so it's necessary for us to continue to watch those, not just in our local environments, but as you can see, Kanchatka's earthquake created large tsunami waves in Hawaii. And so we also need to worry about the, the global effect. Earthquakes don't, you know, they're shaking and their tsunamis don't stop at uh, national borders. Dr. Andrew Newman, geophysics professor from Georgia Tech, I really appreciate your time today. All right, thank you, I had a good time.